Hi everyone, welcome. Hi everyone, welcome back to our uh, multimodality imaging lecture series. It's a great pleasure to introduce today Didi Wang, who is the director of structural heart imaging at Henry Ford. And at a young age, she's accomplished a lot, and she has become a world-renowned imager on structural imaging. So she'll be talking today about 3D printing, computational models, and AI for structural heart disease. Thank you for joining us. Thank you kindly for the invitation. It is truly a privilege to give this talk to everybody. Um, and I hope to entertain you the next 45 minutes on 3D printing, computational models, and AI for social heart disease. Uh, these are my disclosures. And then uh, these are the goals. So what I would really like to bring everybody together is today discuss and recognize the variations in cardiac anatomy by different imaging technologies. I'm gonna put a twist in that. Then I wanna go to the next section where we're gonna really explore the evolution of 3D printing and computational modeling and how we did it at Henry Ford Hospital. And we're gonna conclude with discussing the potential of AI, artificial intelligence and machine learning in structural heart interventions. So let's start off with recognizing the variations in cardiac imaging by different imaging technologies. The one thing that we forget is that we're all trained differently. And you know, in the time span of structural heart interventions, it's required a lot of people to work together. We are all having different spatial understandings. So if we're trained in the cardiac cath lab, our general cardiology fellow that becomes an interventional fellow will only see in two-dimensional fluoroscopy. Potentially, they'll see an ice too. If we go down the imaging track, you're commonly going to be seeing an echo and 2D surface echo and an advanced center, three dimensional TEE. Maybe you'll see a yellow or gold color. And then there's a CT, which is owned by cardiology or radiology, and you can see in 2D, 3D, 4D. But all of these different silos are becoming different spatial training recognition that they might not see in the other person's platform. What I mean by that is if I took the physicians and the medical teams out of the discussion and stuck to what the imaging modality was with two-dimensional floral and red, three-dimensional TEE and blue and green with 3D depth and spatial recognition, we have a language barrier for transcatheter interventions and valvular heart disease that really we need to bridge now for all of our training for all of our medical colleagues. This is what I mean. We forget that the first and most archaic imaging modality is two-dimensional fluoroscopy. Cath lab is what we live by. And this is actually an imaging tool. And we always train our fellows to memorize these standard views. I can always see a first year fellow taking this and memorizing where the LAD runs, where the RCA runs and what angle the senior needs to go in to figure this out. And this is great, but we need to push beyond this barrier if we're thinking about structural, meaning valvular and pellas, we're thinking about VSDs. So there's no longer LAO crany for the RCA or LAO crany or LAO caudal for the actual circ. We're talking about what do we need by chambers? And the other problem that we have is not everybody is gonna be able to see in 3D. So some people on the left are gonna be able to see this, some people on the right will need a three-dimensional image to see that the RCA has a bend and a posterior takeoff and it has an angulation at the marginal branch and that the circumflex when it comes off and it goes to the left atrial appendage has a posterior bend and the LAD has an anterior bend. And so they will take a different catheter to engage this different ostea. And we won't know who can see in 2D and who can see in 3D. There's no way we can test for that, nor will we ever, but we need to educate and bridge for that in transcatheter technologies. So in this patient, I have a patient who has a mitral surgical ring, and then we have a tricuspid ring in red. And how we relearn fluoroscopy for structural heart interventions is learning the chambers. So no longer is it about memorizing the vessels, but it's understanding the four chamber view, two chamber view and three chamber view and how we actually can anticipate that. So an LEO crany might be the four chamber view for many patients if they don't have severe RV enlargement or RV dysfunction. And then an RAO caudal may be a better view to look at the anterior portion of the four chamber view, the valve. And for the tricuspid, an AP view will give you a modified three chamber outflow tract view. These are things that we wanna be able to anticipate for any tricuspid interventions moving forward down the road. 
What this means is that the multidisciplinary heart team has to be able to communicate to evaluate the device selection for the patient. They all have to understand imaging and they all have to then be able to do dynamic interprocedural communication to use the same terms to evaluate short and long-term device efficacy. So this multidisciplinary heart team and multidisciplinary care is a new way of treating as a value-based medicine. Now at Montehart, you guys have wonderful experts, Nazim, Edwin, and the imaging team who already are doing this multilingual discussion between fluoroscopy on the left, CT, and then you also have the three-dimensional TEE on the bottom too. And your team has already published extensively on 3D printing, transcatheter tricuspid interventions. So you are already at the forefront of the technology of where we are with really trying to advance the field of structural interventions. And what we're going to try to figure out is though, how can we improve this to get better devices for our patients utilizing your know-how and what we've understood with three-dimensional imaging. So let's explore the evolution of 3D printing and computational modeling as it happened at Henry Ford Hospital. Now we did not invent this. The pediatric cardiologists have been doing 3D printing for decades. Orthopedics have been doing this for 20, 30 years. I mean, in orthopedics right now, if you can get a knee or a hip replacement, it's actually 3D printed for you. And in dentistry and in the hearing aid industry, all the hearing aids now are also 3D printed. So cardiology is pretty far behind in using 3D print and computational modeling. This is how it started at Henry Ford Hospital in 2013. This was our very first 3D print. I actually have it in my hand. And I remember that day that we got us off the 3D printer. It was a mitral annulus calcification case. We were going to put a transcatheter mitral valve compassionate use of an XT device into the patient because they had no other avenues for their severe MS. And as you can see, we actually built in a frame on the anterior portion so that the 3D print wouldn't fall apart. We had this huge frame on the outside. And then we actually even 3D printed a little tube that represented a 23 or 26 Sapien device that we want to actually superimpose on this. I remember running up and down the staircase showing my team this and my surgeon would say, and look at this, this is a great piece of plastic, but this is not how the mitral anus calcification actually looks. You know, it's actually covered by tissue and covered by skin. And our team will look at it, it'll be great. But we had no idea what to do with it. We just saw it. And we knew that we wanted it because we had no idea how to do really approach a mitral anus calcification case. This is what happened to that case. We got the valve in, but after an hour, the valve embolized. So we had to really figure it out using this 3D print what happened, you know, were we sizing it incorrectly, and what was the true anchoring mechanism, and where do we actually go from here, because we always have more patients needing compassionate use for TMVR in the mitral position, how can we prevent this in the future. So what we learned now, fast forward 2021, is that mitral anus calcification varies on patients, and there's no universal definition. Patient on the left could have mitral anus calcification. Patient in the middle also has it too, but it's not as significant as the one on the left, and it's not circumferential. Patient on the right has mitral anus calcification, but at 12 p.m., where the A ward is located at, there is no calcification for helping anchor. So knowing the variation of mitral anus calcification that we do know now, we have better understanding of the anchoring mechanisms that need to be involved for patients and for prevention of perivalvular leak. So the 3D print brought us the spatial recognition of a virtual 3D model to learn how we can actually utilize this information. When we did this procedure again in patient number three, on the far left, we were not going to embolize the valve. So we sized it appropriately, we had a 3D model and everything. But what we noticed was that afterwards, we had immediate left ventricular outflow tract obstruction. This is patient number three. And we owe this patient so much from the scientific community because that is what led us to doing the LVOT prediction modeling. The scientific endeavor was to make sure that this never happened again. We tried doing simultaneous kissing balloons in the aorta and the mitral to try to balloon the septum open and to create an outflow tract that didn't do much. We basically had to do CPR on the table to create the outflow tract and move the valve mechanically purposely so we can get the patient off the table into intensive care. 
72 hours post-mortem, this is the patient. And what you can see in the far right is the actual arrow showing what the meal LVOT was. You will also see in yellow the native anterior leaflet overhanging the transcatheter valve that was implanted. And this black crescent where you see the actual portion of the white arrow is where we were actually having the neo LVOT. Moving forward then, this is where it prompted us to do the LVOT prediction modeling. So in 2013, we published the first in human transcatheter mitral valve in the annulus calcification. Then we had our device symbolization, and this is a publication of how to retrieve it. Then we published our prediction of the LVOT obstruction to this case, and then this virtual modeling occurred. When we were doing this, we identified that we can identify patients who are also at risk for outflow obstruction, and that led to alcohol septal ablation and laceration of the anterior mitral leaflet. Ultimately, it took almost five years for us to get the validation protocol out because for a long time, we were using a 3D print and physically eyeballing to see if the valve was going to actually obstruct or not if we physically implanted into it. And that's not a sustainable way for science to continue to help these patients. So when we were finally able to validate using the virtual 3D modeling, we found that the neo LVOT cutoff of 190 would give us a risk of outflow obstruction, meaning that in the patient on the left, when the neo LVOT is less than 100, less than 200, we would anticipate they would have an outflow obstruction with this virtual computationally modeled valve. And on the far left, in the peak-to-peak -peak gradient by pigtail and cat, we saw that they had that 80 millimeters of mercury gradient immediately after valve deployment. Whereas the patient on the far right in gray, the neo LVOT was huge, way over 200, there was absolutely no gradient afterwards. And on this graph, you can see that our curvature actually changed when the neo LVOT is less than 200. This is how we evolved with 3D printing and the computational modeling for the actual evolution of TMVR. But, you know, TMVR is old. Uh, we're now in 2021, it seems like 2017 was light years away. So what about present day needs? Well, present day needs, we need to understand the right heart anatomy because tricuspid is the next frontier and we need to understand right heart procedural guidance. But the last time that any cardiology fellow actually goes into the operating room to learn about tricuspid ring annuloplasty has been decades because one, the surgeons don't do single tricuspid annuloplasty devices anymore. It's too high risk. And that this procedure is not a common thing that in the cardiology field we're ever exposed to because TR, we commonly underdiagnose it. So going back to your paper and where you guys had the transcatheter tricuspid interventions, this is where we are now moving to. Mechanisms of right side of heart failure that all the clinical trial devices in the US require. It requires us as a clinical team and cardiology, radiology, and interventional to reassess is it truly tricuspid disease or is it right heart disease? And we need to think about it differently because we're good at looking at leaflets and leaflet abnormalities in this transgastric view. We're good at identifying how many scallops the tricuspid valve has, but now we're at a frontier where we have devices and clinical trial access for patients, but we need to be able to better select the pathophysiology and device for each patient. And what do I mean by that? I give you three patients, all with diagnosis of severe tricuspid regurgitation. A, B, and C, they all have different anatomy. I want to walk you through looking at all three anatomies to really explain what the difference is for patient selection and where we need to be at. You know, in 2009, 2010, 2011, we were doing transcatheter aortic valve replacements. Patient population that we were helping then were basically a high risk, prohibited risk for surgery, and they were patients that were in stage, otherwise hospice. Obviously, now we're doing transcatheter aortic valve replacements in patients who are low risk. Where the analogy to this is for tricuspid regurgitation, we are where we were in 2009, 2010, 2011 with TAVR. We're at the prohibitive high risk patients who are not cast for open heart surgery. That doesn't mean that we shouldn't start standardizations of grading TR or grading right side of heart failure. So number one, right atrium. Looking at the patient on the left, the right atrium in this patient with severe TR dilates actually from the level of the bicable SVC IVC tract to the tricuspid annulus. Patient in the middle actually dilates from a superior to inferior way, and they do not have as much anterior posterior dilatation. That will limit their access to transatrial right heart transcatheter delivery systems, whereas a patient on the left does not. Patient on the right is at an end stage of remodeling where they have superior increase in their right atrial size and an inferior posterior increase too. 
So these are three different right atriums that may not accommodate all delivery sheets for transcatheter interventions and represent three different stages of remodeling that are yet to be defined. Now let's look at the right ventricle because it's all of the right heart. Patient on the left, the right ventricle dilates at the basal portion and also dilates at the inferior margin. If I was to show you this, they also have more of a circularity to the right ventricle representing end stage. Patient in the middle were catching at a moderate stage disease where the right ventricle is still fairly triangular and dilates not so much as the basal portion or the RVOT portion. Patient on the right is where you see the interventricular septal flattening and systole diastole and echo with the horizontal arrow that comes out from the z-axis. And the right ventricle has already angulated, so they're fairly in stage two. This is something that we're not appreciating enough because our standard two-dimensional images aren't giving that perspective to us. And then when we think about disease severity, where the ventricle dilates also affects our ability to do a tricuspid repair technology. Meaning if we're gonna clip leaflets or clasp leaflets, I would wanna do it in this patient in the middle because the right ventricle is not as big or as dilated as the patient on the far left where the basal, mid and apical ventricle are all extremely blown out. Patient on the far right, we still might have a chance with repair technologies if the delivery system can actually enter the right atrium and be long enough in size. But we also have to learn the surgeon's view of the right atrium. So everything that I'm showing you is actually a virtual 3D model. And it's from the CT scan image. So on the left of the surgeon's view, the heart in blue, we mark the left atrium for you. And the right in gray is the right, uh, right atrium. And the far left is my three-dimensional TEE, the same surgeon's view of this patient. And the importance of this is understanding where the anatomical features are that are going to affect our transcatheter delivery system because we can't suture, we can't manipulate the heart, and we really can't touch it. And so what we look at is on the three-dimensional surgeon's view, the tricuspid annulus, we should be able to get all of this on the transesophageal echo as part of our prelim screening. You notice that in this patient with severe TR, they have a triangular tricuspid annulus, whereas the patient on the right has more of an elliptical rounded out tricuspid annulus. Patient on the far right is more in stage than the patient on the far left. Patient on the far left, you put a pacer wire in, they'll be okay for five years. Patient on the right, you put a pacer wire in, you're probably gonna block the septal leaflet. Knowing these variations for cuspid anatomy will help you in patient selection who's easy, who's challenging, who should be first, who should be higher risk. Additionally, you want to pay attention to where the IVC takeoff is going to be. Why is the IVC takeoff important? Well, on the patient on the left with severe TR, the IVC is at 4 p.m. Patient on the right, the IVC is at 6 p.m. Most transcatheter delivery systems are designed by engineers who don't really know the pathophysiology of right heart anatomy and they've already got a design freeze. So a lot of technologies right now only have a single pivot point in their catheters, meaning that if I have a 6 p.m. IVC, I got a straight shot into the right atrium and it's like fishing. I got one pole and go one direction and it works. Whereas the patient on the left, the IVC is at 4 p.m. If I put a straight needle in here, it's gonna go straight to my interatrial septum and my fossa and try to go into the left atrium where we need to recorrect and add secondary to get into the right atrium. How does this apply on the actual three-dimensional TEE? Take the patient on the left and their actual TEE. As the catheter comes in, you will see that we actually have the catheter going from the IVC at 4 p.m. and hitting the fossa, and we have to add a lot of secondary and torque, which may not be feasible for all delivery systems for right heart interventions. It, this affects how we guide the transcatheter delivery systems too, because without the virtual understanding of this, you have the blind leading the blind on a two-dimensional black and white fluoroscopy screen. And when we have a three-dimensional TEE, if we don't have the language correct, we won't be able to guide the interprocedure. So terminologies that we use for the right heart are different because we never realized there were actually three walls. We're used to the left atrium being a D shape. that so we have the anterior wall, medial, lateral, that's it, we're done. The right heart actually has an anterior lateral, anterior septal, posterior septal, posterior lateral view. And this will all get deformed and the size changes on the far right, as you can see when the right heart blows out and gets bigger and gets worse in disease. And so these differences will help us guide. And the importance is, if I was to take a dotted red line and crisscross both of these patients, RA and RV, I will show you what the TEE looks like. The number one question we get asked in the procedure is, where am I? And it's hard to show you on a two-dimensional image where you are. So here we have a clip system in the patient's transesophageal echo, and they're trying to be around the septal border. 
The problem that we don't didn't realize early on is that there are no linear movements in the right heart. So what does that mean? It means that we can't tell them that you're too medial or you're too lateral because they don't know how to read the electric machine and the catheter. We had to be able to direct them three dimensionally because if we can't and we just tell them that you're too close to the coronary sinus, well, what does that mean in my fluoroscopy screen? It means that they're gonna not be able to move and they cause complete heart block. And this is what complete heart block looks like in that patient where you have smoke and basically clot in a whole entire ventricle and you need rapid pace. Why would this happen? Go back to the image on my far left. The AV node is near the coronary sinus, near the actual aortic root behind a non-coronary cusp and any kind of pressure or delivery system pressure on that tricuspid rings will all cause AV conduction blockade. Our surgeons know that, but again, this is a transcatheter, so we're not gonna be able to see this as well. So we have to translate in a three-dimensional mo motion. This is important for form and function for patient outcomes for clinical trial endpoints. It's also important for form and function in device development and endpoints because all the early feasibility studies, clinical trials that we have for all these devices for patients to get access to care require showing efficacy. And knowing these efficacies with what we can see in the virtual and computational modeling will actually get a trial to success faster for better patient outcomes. However, a lot of our current clinical trial endpoints are actually insufficient for our modern day technologies. Let me start with the hepatic vein flow reversal. Um, you're all very well versed in fellowship to be trained and memorized in your echo textbooks. The hepatic vein flow reversal of the SD and A waves will equal to severe TR by echo. It is a marker of severe TR. And that's true, except it's not always true. We never realized the differences in anatomy in hepatic veins. These are three patients with severe TR, and we have a contrast CT. Patient on the left has contrast regurgitating down the level of the IVC and hepatic vein. Patient in the middle does not have as much contrast going to the IVC or the hepatic vein. Patient on the far right has so much TR going down the hepatic veins and the IVC that the regurgitation is actually down the level of the kidneys on this patient. So not all severe TR is gonna reach the hepatic veins. And that's kind of a little bit of mind blowing. How is that even possible? But the guidelines say that that's one of the markers of TR severity. And we're under calling TR severity on our surface echoes using that as a criteria because we're not really able to appreciate the right atrial size. Meaning what? The patient on the left has a bigger uh, right atrium than the patient on the right. I've put the arrows there so you can see that the arrow on the left, if I copied and pasted the arrow on the right, that right atrium is obviously small on the right. So by pure concept of physics or room size, if I have TR and I've got a larger right atrium, there's gonna be more distance to be traveled for that uh, regurgitation to get down to the IVC compared to if I have a smaller right atrium, I've got smaller distance. Hence, this patient's regurgitation goes down all the way to the level of the kidneys. So the distance a TR jet needs to travel, assuming that it's all central and not eccentric, is gonna vary depending on the size of the right atrium and the surface area it's gotta cover. So remember the right atrial sizes I showed you before with different stages on these virtual 3D models, and you can see that now I'm gonna have differences in IVC regurgitation and hepatic vein flow reversal because of this. But then again, there's also variations in hepatic vein anatomy. And the beauty of imaging is what we learn from the same exact image, but we look at it with a different perspective. So I had you look at the IVC before, but now I'm gonna have you focus on the hepatic vein. The hepatic vein, the patient on the left, comes immediately at the RA-IVC junction, so it's very easy and coaxial to the tricuspid annulus. Patient in the middle, the hepatic vein has a 90 degree takeoff and is different from where the tricuspid annulus is, so it requires more angulation for a jet to enter there. And the patient on the right, unfortunately, is double whammy. Not only do they have a lot of TR, it's not right atrium, the hepatic vein comes off extremely coaxial to where TR origination comes from too. But then if we look at these hepatic veins again, we can see that they actually have different sizes. So which patient is going to respond to most of the treatment? Well, the patient in the middle already has huge hepatic vein dilatation. So it will be very common for a radiologist to diagnose suspicion for clinical cirrhosis given hepatic congestion that we see on the CT. Whereas the patient on the far right, because of the hepatic vein 90 degree turn is going down the IVC, they may benefit from a cable valve implantation or may have the most clinical outcome improvement because they're gonna have less cirrhosis. 
And it also depends on what you're trying to treat the patient for, whether it be symptoms, so patient on the far right with edema, coagulopathy, patient in the middle with hepatic vein dilatation, congestion, or edema, patient on the far left too. So what virtual 3D printing and computational modeling has taught us is this. As I show you the right atrium and right ventricle, I'm gonna show you now, this is a TEE view. SVC is at 3 p.m., IVC is at 9 p.m., that's the right atrium. As you take the same exact picture and I tilt the right ventricle to the apex at 12 p.m., this is our trans thoracic echo view, where you see the surface echo right ventricle at 12, huge right atrium at 6 p.m. So if I do this again then, I'm gonna show you what happens. This is our fluoroscopic view. Our fluoroscopic view with the AP with the SVC at 12 and the IVC at six and a pigtail here. So we understand that we have much more complexity to the right heart. And it's not a fault of any of our imaging modalities. TEE, we see a huge right atrium, we the right ventricle. Fluoroscopy, we create the C-arm angulation too. You see the pigtail cath and right ventricle apex. We have a hint of what's going on but we are still at the beginning of learning right heart anatomy because as I show you the right heart here, you see there's a step off. The anterior wall is much more superior in height than the actual posterior septal region. We have that change in a step off there. The SVC is not coming off at 12 p.m. It's coming in with the right atrium divots. So this is gonna be a difficult IJ approach. IVC is gonna be right where this hole is at and gonna have a 90 degree turn effect cuspid annulus. And oh, by the way, the right atrium is extremely posterior. And then this right ventricle has a concavity to it. So when I put a delivery system from the IJ, I'm likely to hit the anterior wall and I navigate this anterior portion of concavity all the way to the RVOT. And this is gonna be extremely challenging for device design because this was not available in the early phase of design freeze. And understanding this tricuspid anatomy then, when I show you this image or the fluoroscopic view from the middle, you see there's much, much more to this right heart anatomy and right heart patient selection. So applying what we learned to fluoroscopy, I showed you this in the beginning, four chamber view, three chamber view, RVOT view, short axis view of a tricuspid ring. There is so much depth to this 2D image that we're not actually having perspective or seeing just yet. And understanding trajectories by showing the red arrow or where the tricuspid ring is and how potential device, pacer wire or anything is implanted will give us much more knowledge and success in our screening and enrollment of patients for really life-saving therapies. So the degrees of comprehension are really, really important and we need to speak all languages. So it's not if you're the cath lab, or if you're the echo lab, or if you're CT. It's not if you're radiology, cardiology, anesthesiology, interventional surgeon. Is really translating, interpreting, and repeating with either it be a physical 3D print or virtual 3D model, so that when we're guiding using whatever modality you have access to, everybody speaks the same terms and languages. So you have success for the patient. You're not stuck in a room getting radiated for over six to eight hours. But what about the potential for artificial intelligence and structural heart interventions? This is actually really cool and really fun. Um, and this is the future of imaging and cardiology. And this is what we wanted to talk about. All the segmentation that we showed you actually is already being applied in real time. Um, so in the top 12 p.m., what I'm showing you is preclinical or device design, device testing on the bench models. So you can actually take CT data sets, MRI data sets, echo data sets, and make a phantom model of any patient's body. And you can implant device, whether it's virtually or physically. And then if you advance beyond a 3D print, you can do the virtual simulation. But then if you have a bridge in between all of this, you wanna do fluid modeling, you can do that before going to an animal model and do computational flow modeling in a tubular setting too. But ultimately, if the physician does not know and the medical team does not know how to guide or implant the case, we have a stoppage of scalability of device design. So we need to actually incorporate physician training with this. And how that's being done is through a few different steps. With the 3D print, that's the first step. You take any CT image or MRI image or echo image, and you can grow or segment the area of the chambers, and then you can clean it up and take the file, which is called an STL file, to a physical 3D printer. And if you're fancy and have an expensive printer, you can put color into it, show different portions of it, and have on the far left a beautiful 3D print. Most of us don't have access to this technology because it's too expensive. So for me, I use the cheapest plastic and white thing because that's what we can afford to make these models for our heart teams. 
The segmentation process is pretty laborious. What it is, is actually it takes mini miniature triangles or segmentations of the, the actual image that's acquired. And in here, it actually grows the contours. It can grow the contours of a ventricular muscle or the chamber, all depends on the region of interest that you want to explore for that specific device and the specific design, device question that you want to engage. Once this is done, you have a, a medical team inspect it to make sure that you're not growing abnormal contours and you have the right chambers done. And then you can take it to the physical 3D printer. When it all comes together, this is a print that you can see, and you can see in the middle on B1 where we have device testing that people can do on the preclinical level. And this is where you have a lot of the RNG start off with all of these for modeling devices and computational flow modeling to see there's leaflet changes or changes in turbulence and flow conduction and, and um, abnormalities. But what we go to is actually clinical trial site training, which uh, Monte Hart is involved in many uh, forward thinking clinical trials and is very critical to advancing structural heart. What we don't realize is that it's already having AI present. So this is what you're showing is hyper-realistic clinical trial training. Surgeons already have access to this when they're trying to teach their surgeon trainees or people that don't have enough clinical Lyme experience how to do mitral rings or leaflet suturing. We do the exact same in structural, not only for TEE, but also for simulation for the implanting team to understand device. So every time you have a clinical trial at Monte Hart, what you probably don't realize is that the clinical team implanting there has already gone to extensive preclinical training, on-site clinical training, and the morning of or the night before had probably three to four hours of bench training with an artificially intelligent or machine learned simulator such as this. And what it looks like is this. They can be also hyper-realistic appearance of the scene of the leaflet. So here we have a mitral leaflet, and this is a surgical uh, rendering for surgeons, but we have the same thing for any kind of tricuspids where we will actually experience this as the implanting team, understanding here's what you're gonna see in the transesophageal echo, here's what we've done in the pre-procedural CT, here's how the device is gonna be simulated, and this is what you're gonna be doing. And then we have bench modeling too of the catheter system and coaching of how the teams are gonna discuss and talk. So the reason that we have this right now in structural heart is actually quite interesting. We're really fortunate to be in a time of cardiology um, that is ex excitingly revolutionizing how we deliver care to patients. What I mean by that is we are having research and design R&D develop devices at the same rate that we're all trying to learn how to image and guide and learn the anatomy uh, without surgeons because we're not cutting open heart. And so without the surgical expertise, we had to bring our surgical experts in to guide us to learn what we're actually seeing on the three-dimensional images, guide us how we're actually doing a device training and learn the complications that the surgeons have already learned for 20, 30 years of why they avoid the AV node and why we always have an incomplete ring in the tricuspid space because they don't want heart block. So since we're developing this in the structural world, this is where the AI simulation training is important for the implanting team. The 3D model is important for translation of terminology and the 3D echo synchronizes everything with the pre-procedural CT imaging so the RNT teams can have the feedback your next generation device, we need this hook to be shorter. Your next generation device, I need a second pivot point at such and such point. But the number one question we have this is, what is the value? Because truly we are in a value-based system right now with healthcare in the US. We had to justify our time and justify our value for everything we do, which has its pros and cons. Um, well, the value is this. I can easily show this image to the cardiology fellows and say, hey, you got to memorize this LAO cranial view that's four chamber because on the middle, when you come in and drop a probe in the TE lab, when I show you this image, you're going to understand that when you clock your TE probe on the far right on this live 3D and you clock your hand, your image is going to go from the medial portion of the valve to the posterior lateral portion of the valve. You can go from A3 to P2. Imagine the overwhelming sensation of fear and anxiety that the imaging fellow or the echo fellow or the general cardiology fellow is going to have in trying to memorize this and synthesize all three images. We can even do it for the two chamber view. This is an easy one, right? We say this is A1, A2, A3, P1, P2, P3, 
they actually, we have no idea what we're talking about. I memorize it for the textbooks, but I don't believe in it. Because if I show you this, as we clock our TE probe, what we're actually literally doing is moving the anterior to posterior position. These three lines represent what you're actually doing. So we start from the aortic anterior medial portion and go to the posterior lateral portion of the left atrial appendage as you take this two-dimensional TE image and scroll your hand. A lot of that is too much to complicate um, in instruct pants catheter interventions because a lot of times you will have implanters try to tell the TE imager, show me the intercommissional view. Why can't I see it? Well, it's because that patient's anatomy is off. Or show me this view. You're not showing me the leaflets. Well, that's because the patient's anatomy is not normal. We can also do this for the three chamber view. This is the easiest view to obtain in the TE lab, your LVOT view, left ventricle is six left aging at 2 p.m. But then when you scroll your hand, you should be able to understand that you can actually, actually skew the image because if you scroll your hand away from you, you'll be going towards left atrial appendage. If you scroll it towards you, you'll be showing A3, P3 and showing actually the common show view. This will change how we select a patient for a transapical tendine device because we won't know how much left ventricle is actually being shown. And what that looks like is this, as I turn this, you can see that the crisscross sections will be medial here and lateral there. And that's what it looks like as we're crisscrossing. Same thing with the short axis aortic valve view. This one you can't get challenged on because it's not obtainable in the cath lab because it's REO 80, queen 42. But as you scroll your hand, you'll be going from medial to posterior. So that degree of fluency and communication is a lot to expect our general cardiology fellows and our general radiology residents to understand in imaging as we move forward because that communication is not present in our current medical training which is where the AI for training for structural heart interventions exists. The 3D print physical models exist because the orange arrow shows the translation we must be able to communicate in less than an hour to implant a device successfully because by the way, the patient's intubated and on the table. This is what it looks like in the cath lab. And so the most important thing to understand is that there does require to be a lot of integration and training from what is going to be a heart team. And the reality is it is much, much harder for an interventional imaging physician to start than it is for somebody to transition from holding a PCI catheter to doing a structural case. If you were just to take a fresh fellow who comes out of training and they're in general cardiology, but you throw them into a lab to do transcaptor interventions, it probably was two and a half years before they had last uh, touched a AL1 catheter. And for them to understand the catheter movements and the CR angulations, it takes a lot of time, investment, integration, and training. And this is very well established for transcatheter interventions for the implanters and the operators from mitral clip. Anand Chaturwala, a good friend, did this beautiful manuscript showing that as you do more procedures, you actually have better procedural safety outcomes, efficiency, and success rates. Sadly, this data will never be available for the interventional imaging physician or the multimodality imaging team that's planning the CT or planning the echo or the paraprocedural screening because that data is not collected in the registries because we're not commonly considered as cooperators. But something that we should be considering and discussing more in time. And it is truly a dual team. And there's a greater learning curve for the multidisciplinary heart team if you have a change of personnel or onboarding of somebody who has less experience than the other person. And I compare it to rally car driving, whether your intervention is a surgeon, established or not established, if they've done 20 or not done 20, it can be a rough ride in the beginning. Same with your interventional imaging physician. The case will not be done in 30 minutes. It will be a two to three hour case because they have to understand everybody's synchronization and they understand everybody's uh, uh, skill level and what they want to say and what they don't want to say. But what else is the value of having this AI for structural heart interventions and for procedural planning? Well, we have to really understand that we in medicine have limited ourselves in same value, and we limited to technology technicians. So in the multimodality field, you can understand that people will always say, oh, the left, TEE is all I need. Patient on the right, CT, I don't need the CT. One is more valuable than the other, but actually we limit ourselves as a multidisciplinary heart team to access of care for patients. What do I mean by that? Well, there's value in the TE probe. It has color that I cannot see on CT. It has quantification that I cannot see on CT. 
But what is the value of understanding TEE versus surface cycle? Is one superior or better? And the guidelines say that we need to grade severity of TER, or MR, or MS by surface cycle first and not TEE because it will become hypotensive during intubation. Well, maybe we need to re-understand these two images, the left atrium on the bottom and the left atrium on the top left. Because what we realize is that on echo, we're not actually even seeing the left atrium. And before we say how the guidelines are asking us to interpret the left atrium dilatation for MR, TR severity, we have to take a look at the whole constituent and what that looks like in anatomy. Meaning we need to think in three dimensions. I take the same exact patient with severe MR. I show you the left atrium at 12 p.m., left ventricle at 6 p.m., and aorta at 2 o'clock. And I show you that because we have to be able to see and think in 3D. When I crop out only the left atrium, I cut the pulmonary veins off. I just turn this for you. Who would have thought the left atrium looked like that? Obviously, it's not purple. But if I take this and show it to you and show you the heart again, who would have thought the left atrium is amorphous? So if we're not sweeping to look at our left atrium on our surface echoes, it would be small if I just saw this AP view in the four chamber. But as I turn it, if I cut my plane right over here, that's a huge left atrium. So all of those funny shapes that we see on echo and all those things, we might not be seeing everything in this 2D image. This left atrium might not have been there if we had understood the images better. Meaning that if I take two different patients, both with severe TR, we will always you know, teach our sonographers. You're training them to say that the triangle shape that you trace on the four chamber view is not the left atrium shape. It's gotta be multiple points and you're looking at it differently. Maybe they weren't wrong. It wasn't a poor tracing because the patient on the left has a left atrium, it's somewhat triangular. Patient on the right is too, but they're more amorphous because the image of the left atrium has much more depth perception than we were understanding. And that if we don't sweep, we're not seeing these odd shapes that were always there on our surface and TEE images. So going back to how it started, we weren't looking to create 3D printing or bring 3D printing into cardiology. We had a patient that was turned down for all options. So we started with a physical 3D print and we tried to put a model in there and put the heart in there. And we put a quarter as a reference to what the size of the neo LVOT is actually for patients. And this is how we started doing this. We realized that we were onto something because TMVR technology was not going away. So we had to find an algorithm so it was reproducible. But physically printing a 3D print, which takes about four to 16 hours sometimes, is not going to be cost effective or actually effective for patients who need quick care. That's why we went to virtual 3D modeling and computational modeling, where we understood our cut planes and went to neo LVOT prediction modeling, and it took us a few years to get enough patients to actually validate that protocol. And then what we found was that, you know, we even despite our best efforts, our pre and post CT matched to some degree, but we weren't at 100%. And that was frustrating. And that goes back to where we are now because we realized that we don't have a steerable sheet. Meaning that on the patient on the left, when I put computational modeling for a transcatheter heart valve in there and then scan and post, this is a post patient. And you can see the valve cans towards the lateral edge of left atrial appendage. On my LVOT view, the anterior origin which cans ventricularly. And on my surgeon's view, you can see that the valve actually has a dark crescent because it's actually canted more in this medial portion and it's actually more atrial in the ventricular portion. Why is that the case? Because then we realized that no two fossa ovalis are the same. Some are wide and large, as I showed you in the black here. Some are extremely posterior. So we realized that we were teaching transeptal crossings wrong. There are multiple papers, papers that say for a left atrial appendage, we stick inferior posterior. For a mitral clip, we stick superior and posterior. And there's multiple exclusion criteria for transeptal heights for new devices. But as we can see, everybody's fossa comes out differently. In this patient, I could stick anywhere I want in the fossa and be okay. Patient on the far right, I have limited options. And the difference between this is that if we can't see that on 3D and the team doesn't understand, you can always go to a cadaver model. But not everybody's going to have access to a cadaver lab. On this patient, when they actually put the light on the fossa, you can see it's extremely anterior in location. Patient on the far right has a wide posterior one. If I was to say which one is easier for a team to start off with a new device, we would go for the patient on the right for transcatheter mitral because there's less challenging anatomy. Whereas the patient on the left, I'm gonna to have to stand the system up. I'm gonna to have to stick as posterior as possible. And I will need a lot of secondary torque. 
knowing all of these is why we have 3D printing, virtual 3D modeling, because not everybody has access to the same resources. As you can see, this is from Dimitri Levin at the University of Washington. But in teaching this, we want to emphasize that actually each heart is unique. When I show you three different hearts, obviously they're not different colors, but what I'm trying to show you is that LVOT on this patient has a forward motion and then anterior uptake. Patient in the middle has a swan neck LVOT. Patient in the far right has a basal septal hypertrophy. Every single nuance and angulation will change the flow velocity, turbulence, and likelihood of device success and device longevity down the road. And every single nuance that we have will change how we do transcatheter heart delivery manipulation to find a different landing zone. I wanna leave a parting thought to the imaging physicians in the audience. Um, and I want to just address you know, we talk about 3D printing and AI and virtual modeling, and a lot of times people will say, well, that's great. I had a 3D print and I get the phone call. That didn't help me that much. I'm like, well, who was your imaging physician? Oh, did I need to involve them in the team for this? Um, and I want to implore that, you know, stop calling yourself by your tool, meaning that we're not very cool. And I'll say this because when operators say I'm an interventional cardiologist, I'm a CTO operator, I'm a high-risk peripheral specialist, or I'm a transcable guru, all the general cardiology fellows will go, wow, cool. But you know, if we go, I'm interventional echo, and you should do a career in interventional echo, my general cardiologists and my general cardiology fellows are just like, right, Dr. Wow. Okay. And what you really want to think about is for all the imaging physicians out there in the audience, don't brand yourself as your toolkit because you have so much more medical know-how. The reason I say this is. You do not hear anybody on any conference or circuit tell themselves, tell you at the audience proudly, I'm an interventional fluoroscopist, or I insufflate, or I'm an FFR wire, or I'm an ice catheter, I'm a lithotripsy balloon, or I bovi. Um, so why are we interventional echo? And where we are right now with 3D printing, virtual modeling, AI, is really integrating all we need from what has been a heart team. And as interventional imaging physicians, this is a manuscript that's under review right now. We found that most of them are just like Edwin in their early career and or their late stage career because of lack of reimbursement and lack of ability for training. So who are you? We see you, we recognize you, let us help you in doing this. But in the interval, push for the understanding that this is not just 3D print or AI or virtual modeling or computational modeling, it's actually integration with multidisciplinary heart team and navigating it as a heart team for interventional imaging and structural imaging. So in conclusion, the heart is absolutely gorgeous and no heart is the same. And it's really about structural imaging interventionalist, the heart team. And we need to learn and teach our trainees to see this 3D in all of our 2D images. Our 2D images are incredible. We just need to appreciate them. It's not about echo, TE or CT. We need to also understand the 4D anatomy for anatomical and transcatheter guidance. And you know, as you move forward, the value is gonna be a multi-phase proposition. It's in the education of the future generation of physicians, it's for the current transcatheter device, but it's also for the patient to have longevity and outcomes without deterioration in the device that we implant in 2021. Thank you very much. I'm open to questions. Thank you, Dr. Wang, very much. That was an amazing lecture and what a pleasure to have you. You're definitely pushing the, the field forward. So uh, for all of us that think that this is the future, that this, this was great. Uh, we have Mark, Dr. Mario Garcia and Edwin here too. Do you guys want to start with a question? Let me, uh, let me start. I have, a, first of all, to congratulate Dr. Wang, and I, would, I wouldn't call this a lecture. This was actually a symposium even in one hour, I, I, I could uh, certainly uh, say that most of us will take more than five hours to cover uh, what you cover uh, here. Congratulations. Thank you. Um, I, I do have a, a question uh, uh, and you answer it uh, uh, partially towards the end, which is, is being always in my mind. Is it really uh, that much of an advantage to do physical printing over just using the virtual? Uh, modeling. Um, today, virtual uh, is so much uh, faster and, and so more flexible and uh, so real. Um, uh, in fact, visualization in 3D is, is so much possible and navigation too. And the second one related to that, which obviously makes it easier on the virtual domain, 
is whether it has any value to examine multiple phases of the cardiac cycle and look at the dynamic changes uh, on the geometry um, through uh, systole and diastole. Yes, so thank you for the question and the compliment. So the first question is, is there any value to the physical 3D print if you have a virtual 3D model? And that goes to my Venn diagram that I had in the beginning. Um, and, you know, so in the back of my office, you can see I've got two shelves for full physical 3D prints. <laughs> um, and uh, the value we found is that there is no value in repetition of 3D printing um, on a case that you and the team already experienced in. Virtuous 3D modeling is sufficient at that point. So for our transcatheter mitral valves, we don't physically 3D print anymore. When we initially physically 3D printed, it was really to really advance the field of CT to show people the value of that and learn it. But we couldn't use it using transcatheter mitral valves because there's so few patients at that time. So we did it under left atrial appendage because it's a very reproducible study and scan. Um, that being said though, we do use physical 3D printing for all of our clinical trials meaning that for every new clinical trial device we do, we found there's a language barrier between the clinical field specialist and the implanting team. And we have the patient's physical 3D print before the clinical trial case to review. Everybody has a synchronization of the anatomy. And we bring that into the actual procedure cath lab to actually translate between the cases too, when we get stuck at a certain point and have challenges in anatomy. A lot of times it's not the imaging physician having difficulty explaining what's going on. It's the inability to just show that on a fluoroscopic view. Um, so there are a lot of fusion technologies available, but everybody seems to have a different depth perception and that's where the physical 3D print seems to occur uh, to benefit. Regarding the question about multi-phase analysis. So uh, multi-phase analysis in the neo LVOT for transcatheter mitral was brought up in the setting of the Medtronic Apollo device because it's actually was challenged at, you know, were we using too much of it in systole? Uh, one of the things that we have to understand as an imaging community is the device design. So every device has a different way of causing critical outflow obstruction. So if a device is a closed cell technology like a sapien, then our neo LVOT modeling is very valid. But if it's a device that has an outer shell that's open cell technology, that's not going to be the same for our neo LVOT prediction modeling. Multiphasic analysis is actually helpful. However, um, in the interest of thinking hokum, we always do hokum interrogation and in systole, and, and mid to in systole, excuse me. And that's where we're thinking about also doing for TMBR. What we see right now is that um, there are different definitions of systole between the CT world and the echo world. Uh, in systole in the CT world sometimes goes to 55% or 50% of the cardiac cycle. But in cardiology, we know that that's early diastole. So we don't model in that. So when we have publications come out, it's very important for us to understand what was the definition of systole in that patient, which is why I always say mid to in systole or whatever phase you can give me between 10 and 45%, I'll analyze that. Otherwise, there's no warranty on the neo-LVOT that we give you. Thank you very much. Uh, Edwin, would you like to do any questions? Yeah, absolutely. So, I mean, first of all, Didi, thanks so much for taking us through that really spectacular journey through a lot of aspects of structural imaging that was really phenomenal. Um, and thank you for also demonstrating, you know, all the extra, you know, subtleties that we really think about in structural imaging and why structural imaging in 2021 really is its own subspecialty within the imaging world. Um, I wanted to talk a little bit about the, the right-sided uh, anatomic variability that you demonstrated so nicely. You know, certainly something that we think about so much now that there are actually different investigational devices um, to consider for a lot of these patients. Um, as you are well aware, you know, T imaging and guidance can be kind of a nightmare in some of these. Have you found that the CT has been helpful in predicting things like the imaging planes, um, imaging quality, optimization, uh, based on what you see on the CT scan, the rotation of the heart, the position of the esophagus? Absolutely. So great question. Is CT predictive of the image quality or the image difficulty or challenges that we're going to have? Absolutely. Um, the number one problem we have with right heart technologies right now in clinical trials is 
uh, not having confidence on both the implanting team or the team that's actually involved in approving this, that the device is going to be able to be navigated successfully in that patient because there's a fear that the right heart or tricuspid is difficult to image. I didn't add in my slide, but the right heart is actually not challenging the image. You know, esophagus runs behind the right heart. The only time we're not going to be able to image is if there's a hiatal hernia in place because echo does not penetrate air. Um, and so on CT, when we capture all the plain field for tricuspid annulus, you can quite easily see the esophagus is touching the right heart at the RARV. And you can see the angulations and anticipate who should be a left femoral vein axis, right femoral vein axis to get the coaxiality you want and the angles you want. The reason this is extremely important is as medical education continues to evolve with Monte Heart and your team in advanced with fellows training, we will then be able to distinguish is this truly an anatomical barrier exclusion or was this truly a skill that we just didn't advance the probe like you know, 0.5 millimeters more and retroflex just a tiny little bit and we didn't have somebody holding this who's done this procedure a few times. Um, and that's where the CT can actually identify where the learning deficits are so we can advance more. But a lot of that also requires integration of the teaching between CAT and floral and the fellows rotating with structural early on, both from radiology and cardiology, so you can kind of bypass that. So short answer, absolutely. Um, and one of the biggest problems that we have is the need for repeat TEEs. And I feel bad for those patients because there really is not a need for a repeat TEE. Just take a look at the esophagus, make sure it's behind the heart, and then you'll be okay. Thank you very much. And we have some questions from your audience, from the audience as well. We have one from Nicole Wake that runs our, our 3D printing like lab, like I was telling you before, and one from Amanda Tenhoff. There are similar. So you you briefly mentioned on this, but. So which patients have the highest yield? Which patients do you select for 3D printing? The highest yield patient is the one that your heart team needs for the procedure. Whichever one your team says, I need this, I can't understand this, jump on it and that's your first priority. That's the value. If you're trying to do a manuscript, it's the one that's most reproducible. Um, and there's plenty of space for this technology, but the value is the one where your heart team asks for help. And if you try to create, and as you have a 3D printing program already, if you want to scale your 3D printing program, it's not what you want to print or what you think is pretty or what you think is cool. It's what the heart team is having the most complications in. And whatever the complications they have, that's how you show your value. That's a great answer. And uh, from Agustin Koisnet, that it's similar. So when do you go then further and you use uh, fusion imaging? Which patients you select for that? Uh, so fusion imaging, well, there's a different definition for fusion imaging depending on what resource you have. Um, and it all depends on what your implanter can see and what your imager can understand and translate. Our fusion imaging is our virtual 3D model and then our three-dimensional TEE. Uh, we don't use any kind of other photographic overlays. Um, some facilities and hospitals, health systems uh, will not have access to an interventional imaging position. So they use fusion technologies to guide transepto or they use ice. Um, so regarding that, it all depends on what resources you have access to and then what fusion. Now fusion imaging is expensive. It all depends on what procedure you wanna scale. If it's a procedure that's gonna be less than 20 in a year, I doubt administration will pay for it. But if you're gonna demonstrate scalability and growth, then you will have value in convincing it. But typically with the current reimbursement model, I'm, I'm sure Edwin's aware, interventional imaging physicians are cheaper than any fusion technology, unfortunately. <laughs> okay, thank you very much. I'm going straight to, to spending money. So what softwares do you use? And what uh, for here they're asking for 3D reconstruction for STL files or PDF files? There are a lot of them out there. The TMVR that we use, the anatomical 3D printing is materialized. Um, that's the software that we use. That's the one that we found was most reproducible and that's where our validated neo LVOT protocol comes from. We use all of that for all of our 3D printing in-house and virtual modeling. We use Vitria for all of our uh, standard caliber planning. Perfect. And what about the uh, MRI 3D printing? Is that, uh, is that What's the status of that field? MRI is a technology that is just beautiful. It, it Unfortunately, for the structural community, it's difficult for a patient to lie flat for an hour, especially with valvular heart disease. 
And the limitation with MRI 3D printing, it's good and it's used in the pediatric population because they want to avoid radiation. But for transcatheter structural heart interventions, it's a little bit limiting because the slice thickness is five millimeters. So typically what we do for all of our uh, TMVR, PVLs, LVO, T-fed cuspid, we're printing at uh, 1.5 millimeter slice thickness. Anything beyond that, we can't guarantee the accuracy because we're trying to get close to what the catheter is going to see. And most catheters are three millimeters in the dimension. That was, that was great. Okay, so thank you very much for your time and for being with us. And hopefully we can have you here in person soon. All right. Take care, everybody. Thank you so much for the invite. Bye-bye.